everyone. Welcome to Look Down There. I'm your host, Michelle Lamour. My guest today is a licensed clinical psychologist and sex therapist with her own private practice in Beverly Hills called SHAPE, which stands for Sexual Health and Pleasure Enhancement. Love it. She specializes in providing adult sex education and integrating sexuality and spirituality and self-discovery for personal growth. Please welcome my guest, Dr. Shannon Chavez. Hi, Shannon. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yes, I am so excited to see you. Um, I first met you uh, back in March of this year at a conference in, in Malibu uh, with Sluts and Scholars, uh, Women Who Wonder. And you were in charge of the shame room and uh, yeah, that was a really great experience. Um, but we'll we'll talk about that later because um, it definitely brought up things for me um, that I wasn't aware that I was dealing with. Um, but yeah, let's let's talk about how you got into uh, this line of work. Yes. Well, I'm glad that you brought up the shame room because shame was actually a big part of why I got into this work. First off, I, you know, grew up like many people in a conservative culture as a Latina and grew up Catholic. So I knew from a very young age that sex made people uncomfortable. And I saw the shame, you know, shame within, you know, my family and people talking about sex. So I was one of those kids that actually asked all the questions. So when I thought about a career in psychology, I really wanted to work with individuals and couples around sex concerns and not just dysfunction, but sexual health, really helping people understand all the aspects of what sexual health is. And for myself, I wanted to know about that early on. You know, what else is involved with sexual health? You know, like many people, I didn't have the sex education that probably we need as adults to navigate sex and intimacy. So I wanted a practice that kind of gave all of those things to clients, resources, tools, education about sexual health and wellness, and resources to help with things like concerns and problems through all areas of the lifespan. Because I want people to also know that we all have sexual problems. That was another reason that I wanted to get into this work is to really help break down the stigma and shame that having a sex issue means that you're abnormal or there's something wrong with you, but that we all have them. And we can kind of have that collective knowledge and community to help each other deal with those concerns. Yes, I, I love that. I think it's it's so shocking how much we don't know and how much uh, adults need sexual education. Um, sometimes I think you you know we have we have sex education sort of when we're kids. Um, you know, you just like learn the parts, the basic things, but you don't really learn about, um, you know, your identities and how you relate to others and what is exciting and what's pleasure and, and, and you know, where is that line? And, and sometimes I think, can we have a, an additional sexual education in college or something, you know, when we're, we're a, a bit more mature to talk about these things? Exactly. Right. And yeah. you mentioned a good point. You know, adult sex education is something I offer at my practice. And I think a lot of people would come in and go, what is that? You know, what is adult sex ed? And it's exactly what you describe, you know, understanding your body, knowing what feels good for you, being able to answer those questions, and then also filling in the gaps where you feel like you might want to feel more confident. For example, intimacy, communication, anatomy and physiology of all different parts and partner you know, identities. And I think that's really important in sex ed is that you know about not just yourself, but about the partner or partners, bodies that you are connecting with. So that's really what my practice provides. And I'm, I was so excited to start SHAPE because I wanted it to be more than just a therapy practice. I wanted it to be 
you know, a place where people can come, even if they're having a great sex life and just wanted to say, hey, we want toys or we're looking for resources or things are going well here, but we just want to keep, you know, that nice flow of exploration. What can we do? So that's the fun part of sex therapy and education that I really have designed in my practice that I want people to be aware of. Yes. And I, I love the pleasure enhance, enhancement aspect of what you do because, you know, we, we want to explore, but maybe we're not sure how to explore or who to go to or who to talk to. And I love talking about the things that we don't talk about. So I, I think it's so great that you have this practice where people can come and feel comfortable exploring different, um, ways to pleasure each other or pleasure themselves really exactly. um and that self-discovery is is so important and um really like for me um i just learned that the clitoris was a wishbone shape which you have a great uh, yeah. necklace <laughs> on that. Um, but i just found that out this year at the age of 40. um i had no idea and um, that was like a revolutionary thing for me, you know, like where you can explore different sensations and different pleasures, you know, just knowing your parts. Exactly. Anatomy is so important. And I love that. I love that you discovered that because when people kind of know more about the clitoris, this sort of, you know, organ of pleasure that we have, you can see so many more possibilities with what your body can experience as far as pleasure potential, orgasm potential. And I think it builds empowerment because knowing your body then leads to being able to show a partner how to pleasure your body. And there's so many possibilities. You know, I, I think anatomy is so important and not only just knowing your anatomy, but being able to be curious about your anatomy. I encourage my clients to actually look at their bodies touch them, smell them, do all the things that actually do create a lot of shame, right? Do I look normal? Is this right? And I love talking about anatomy with my clients. For example, I was just talking about the clitoral hood this week and how it's this big part of our pleasure potential as well, that you can stroke it, massage it, and all the things you can do. And I love that you know, we can talk about our anatomy and get excited about it and learn about a new part and say, Ooh, now I want to go explore that. Or how can I use a vibrator, a tool or a toy to enhance pleasure there? And, um, as you can see, I get very excited about the clitoris. <laughs> I love it. Yes. <laughs> That's great. Or a clit, a clit cheerleader. It's good. Clit cheerleader for sure. For sure. Yes. <laughs> it's so good. So what is, maybe the most common thing that you find people don't know about sex or their own sexuality? I would say how our sexual desire works. I think there's been a lot of information out there, right? We have a sex drive or libido or desire works this way or the myths about desire, especially for females, which may be that we experience less desire than males or we're not as visually stimulated as males. And so all of those myths and beliefs, I feel lead to not only questions, but concerns, you know, I'm not experiencing it this way. So there must be something wrong with me. So that's why I love education, because when you actually get to talk about those things, you realize that nothing's wrong with me. My desire is actually normal or it ebbs and flows, which is also normal. So that's probably the most common thing I see in my practice is either desire discrepancies or just questions about desire, how it works. And I love talking about it and talking about the brain. I talk a lot about the brain, the mind-body connection and all the aspects of knowing your sexual response that can actually help you feel more connected to what's going on in your body rather than trying to fit, you know, the norm or belief that you've been carrying around with you for probably sometimes decades before really knowing right information. Right. And there is such a, a virtue placed on being normal. Um, but what is normal? And it's part of the, one of the reasons why I started this initiative, because we just, we aren't aware of, 
of what we look like. We, we're not aware of what other people look like. We're not aware of what our own bodies look like. And there, there isn't a normal is, is really the answer. There's not a normal. There's a normal for you. There's a normal for your body, but there's not a normal across the board. And um, that also goes for pleasure. I think we're in this society and culture that places a lot of weight on guilt for, for experiencing pleasure, whatever that pleasure might be, right? The guilty pleasure of watching a bad movie or eating a naughty snack or something. <laughs> yes. yeah. Lots of guilt, right? I mean, guilt and shame are kind of in this relationship together. Yeah. I see them come up a lot. Definitely. definitely. Right. Yeah. And, so uh, yeah, shame. I mean, let's, let's talk about it. I mean, what, what can we do to help alleviate this burden of shame? Because so many of us are, are walking around with this shame blanket, the shame monster um, every day. And sometimes we, we don't even know that we're carrying it. We're so used to the weight that it usually takes a light from the outside to realize mm -hmm. you know, what what's been going on so what can we do to help alleviate that you know first of all talking about it like you and I are doing today and providing information I think that's what I've seen be the biggest shift for people around shame is getting the right information and going oh wait I'm normal or because I like this that's actually okay and it can alleviate so much shame that blanket can be lifted just by talking about it and having a safe space to talk about it I think you know I always say bad things come in three when it comes to shame guilt and fear you know there's fear of judgment there's fear of you know what will other people think of me you know what what if I'm not normal and how will I fit in and knowing this about myself so I think that definitely is an aspect that helps and also being able to, you know, dedicate time to your sexual health and journey. I think that part of what we experience with shame is that we don't, we kind of stuff it away and hope that it kind of takes care of itself. But being able to prioritize your sexual health or wellness or even mental health, if you're carrying that blanket around can alleviate shame and not only make you feel better about your sexuality, but also maybe lead to a different path of what you might need around your sexuality. So I think that there's a lot of, you know, real quality that can come to your life by, by alleviating shame in any of those ways. And it doesn't always have to be therapy. Sometimes it's going to a community workshop or a meetup or some place where you get to have that safe container that, can be just enough to, to heal shame. Like we saw at the workshop that we did, you know, we had the shame room and I remember uh, Mo and I, the co-facilitator saying, oh, you know, are people going to show up? All the other workshops are so, you know, uplifting and we're talking about this, this very heavy topic. But I was really surprised and honored to see so many people coming in and sharing their stories. And even people that didn't share that day later on coming up to us saying, wow, I felt so much healing happen, even by listening to other people's stories. So that's another way to alleviate shame that can be just as effective as doing your own work. Yeah. I, I mean, I remember sitting in that room and I remember at the top of the day, they said, okay, you're going to go here and learn how to masturbate. And then you're going to go <laughs> and like look at a vulva and then you're going to go to the shame room. And I was like, Oh my God. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's so funny because a few days or I don't know, maybe a week or so before this event, I came to realize that I was carrying shame around my period mm. that I, I had no idea that I was carrying this for so long and I only came to find out about it just because I, I journal every day and I just go I just kind of vomit on the page and all this stuff came out and it totally took me off guard I, I really um did not know that that was a thing and then the more that I learned about it the more I I learned that other people also experience shame surrounding this. And for me, the shame was 
yes, like, oh, it's gross or whatever, you know, that kind of, that kind of aspect of it, but also just feeling um, bad about how my moods fluctuated and how that affected my life. And so really when I, when I learned about this with myself, I learned how to work within the cycle. I learned how to identify the markers of my cycle, like, you know, how I'm feeling this day, what can I expect uh, this day? Like, yes, I'm going to have cravings this day or bloated or whatever. And I can kind of track that now every month. And it's actually really empowering. And I, I love it. Like, I love my period. I'm happy to have it. <laughs> yeah, I love to hear that. I love that. Yeah. And I love that you said data tracking, because this is something that I teach a lot of clients around sexual health. You know, we have technology now, like apps that actually support our sexual health, whether it's like you're saying, you know, a place to track moods and what's going on so you can see how things change and how it's connected to hormones or other stages and changes of your cycle. So it normalizes those mood swings or, or what may be going on, like depressive symptoms or anxiety. So data is great. I encourage people to, to download these apps and really have that. And another thing I see too is, you know, women saying, you know, I never knew that I couldn't get pregnant, you know, only during an ovulation window. And sometimes I thought that was always a risk. So we learn so much about our bodies by tracking our data and understanding how our bodies work. So I love that that was something that helped you. And I I hope that even listeners will hear that and maybe, you know, encourage, you know, finding something like that to help in their own life. Yeah, I, I am so happy to, to do that. And, you know, now I can, I can say, oh, I'm, I'm having these thoughts and I'm having these feelings and doubts or anxiety or whatever. And I can say, Oh, my period's coming in a few days. So I won't give this as much weight as I might otherwise, because I know things are happening in my body and I only have so much control over (laughs) what my hormones are doing. Right. Um, But really I, I didn't um, get to know that part of myself until I got off the pill Uh, the pill was just handling things for me and it was easy and predictable, you know? And so when I got off the pill is when I really started learning about what my body was doing and what, you know, what I could expect. So it was really like learning my body all over again, you know, at the, I think I went off at the age of 35 or so and, Mm -hmm. um, I was like, what's going on? What's happening? You know? And I, I had, it was, it was a struggle between me and my partner as well, because um, this was new for him. And, you know, why were these moods happening or why would fights happen at this certain time of the month? Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. I always ask my clients that when they're like, you know what, I'm having problems with my relationship. I'm saying, I always ask how, close is it for your cycle to start when is menstruation coming because you could be in that sort of pre you know menstrual week where you know you are so upset at everyone and so that's such an important thing it normalizes that and we can even give our partners warnings right hey you should know about my cycle as well so if things do come up maybe there's a little bit of extra you know TLC during that time or emotional support so that it can, you know, help keep some harmony in the relationship as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure. That's yeah. the next phase of tech is having partners be shared on all the data. So we have a shared calendar. So, you know, when things are coming and all the data is there for, yeah. for partners. Yeah. And like, <laughs> while it, it, it is helpful and he actually does track things. And so I when I that. start to um, act a certain way or say something that's like a little off of, of my normal, um, he'll like take out his phone and look at the date. Where are we in the and then phone? I, of course, am like, it's not because of my period. And you know, I get mad and I'm like, oh yeah, it is. I love it. I love it. I mean, we need to, you know, just sort of normalize that. Exactly. I mean, hormones are powerful. I think we don't know 
enough about hormones and how they affect our body. And I'm always fascinated as a psychologist about, you know, hormones and neurochemistry and how all of it plays a big role, even in things like shame and how we feel about ourselves. So it's, it's all important, you know, inside and out, we've got to know our bodies and even, you know, male partners have cycles. They go through cycles where they have dips in their testosterone and hormones just like we do and so i always you know kind of tease my partner you know is it is it that time of the month for you because we we were both go through those changes so uh you know it's just a good thing to normalize yes yes i, I love <laughs> that and i also love um normalizing the the vulva and all all the special and wonderful things that it can do and the body is so intricate like everything you were just talking about with hormones and cycles and our mm -hmm. own patterns and just getting to know that and getting to know ourselves and and getting to know our own vulva and um how that works for us and what we can expect as far as like you were saying smell or look or taste or you know discharge or whatever discharge. Um, yes thank you <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I was just listening to an interview the other day um and they were talking about discharge and how there's so much shame surrounding discharge and they were saying that there was some instagram challenge which i had i have not seen but they were saying that there was a challenge where girls would take pictures of their panties at the end of the day if they didn't have discharge and it was like a badge of honor oh <laughs> oh these challenges make me cringe sometimes but uh you know i i can't believe that that's the case i mean it just goes to show that even these you know different generations are still struggling with things and we have to you know make change and what i love about social media is the access to information but it can also be detrimental to our health when we see challenges like this and you know discharge is something that we don't know enough about and we don't talk about and that's another piece around how we can reduce shame so i definitely encourage my clients to do that you know look notice make tracking changes of anything going on in your body and let's talk about it. And if you have questions, bring them in. And even if you don't want to ask the questions in therapy, some of the apps are really great. For example, there's an app called Flow where you can have secret chats where you can ask a question anonymously, get good information. And what I found just kind of browsing myself is that there are just so many places to get information. There are, you know, speaking of data and resources, you know, just one app can provide so much resource. And, you know, for example, you can look up discharge and you can get, you know, lots of answers and insight, ask your own questions. So I feel like there's always an outlet to help. And that's what I love about technology. So even though social media may be going in the wrong direction, we can get, you know, information and accurate information in other places. And maybe we need to create more sex challenges, sexual health challenges for people that, you know, kind of counteract the shaming that's going on around this particular example that you gave. Okay, Shannon, I hear you. I hear you. We're doing it together, <laughs> Michelle. <laughs> Let's talk. <laughs> I'm open, I'm open to it because I don't know if you remember the cucumber challenge a while back, but that was another challenge around, uh, you know, oral sex. And, and it, you know, I think it, if anything, it, it kind of led to less empowerment and more stigma for a lot of women. And, and I think that's what we've got to change. And these challenges, I don't know who's starting them, but I'd love to have a conversation, a friendly conversation with them mm -hmm. and see if we can create a shift somewhere. Yeah. Right. And social media is, I mean, yes, there are good parts of social media. Sometimes you have to dig a little bit to find it. Um, thank you for mentioning the name of that app, Flow. I wrote that yes. down for sure. Thank you. Um, but yes, getting good information and the right information is, is really important. So what should people be looking for when they're looking for this type of information or perhaps are looking for a sex therapist or a sexologist and another question on top of that question is what's the difference between a sexologist and a sex therapist 
great question. Let's answer that first. So many sex therapists like myself are actually also sexologists. And a sexologist is someone who has background training and expertise and certification in sexology, this really fancy word that basically stands for you know, the observation and understanding of sexual behavior. So sexology kind of dives deep into behavior, why we do what we do sexually, and the training behind that helps people work with individuals, maybe on a coaching or an education level, to provide help in whatever area they may need. Where sex therapy are licensed mental health professionals, they can be psychologists like myself, marriage and family therapists, social workers, and they have training in mental health, obviously to be licensed, but then have specialized training in sexuality. So when you're looking for a sex therapist, I always advise anyone to make sure that you're working with someone who's certified or who has that background in training. One thing I have seen out in the field is many people call themselves a sex therapist, but maybe haven't had the training. And I think it's really important because sex therapy and sexology training isn't just getting the information and being trained in the information, but it's also doing the work individually. So to become certified, you have to do your own work around dealing with all your shame and what pushes your buttons so that you're able to be a better help for people coming in and that you're not going to create any harm for people coming in around shaming or judging or implying anything around their sexual behavior, but that you create a real safe container for them. So that's the main difference between the two. Both are great. It's just really what you're looking for. And the thing I usually let people know is not all sexual concerns require therapy. Sometimes it's just coming in and getting some suggestions or resources and that's why I provide both within my practice. I don't want to imply that you have to come in and tell me everything about your childhood in order to deal with a sexual problem, but it may just be, hey, what do I need? Or is there something that I can use to help me improve this area? So that's the main difference there. Yeah, and it's good just to know, you know, what kind of toys should I be using or what's out there? What kind of lube should I use? And just the the sexual health aspect of pleasure as well, which I love that you provide both things. And I love that you integrate sexuality with spirituality, because to me, they are one and the same. I feel yes. like yes. we experience our spirituality with orgasm, with sex, with connection. And so I love that that is a part of your mission. Yes, it really is. And I think that, you know, I've always loved spirituality. I have a niche area working with people coming from conservative cultures and religious groups. So I know that spirituality isn't just religion, but I would say many people have been influenced by religion in some way. That was my experience. I find that many people come in. And so I want people to look at spirituality as more of who am I and seeing how that's integrated in with your sexual awareness and who you are as a sexual being, because a lot of the things that kind of cross into both areas are what motivate you towards your own meeting of your needs or asking for what you want. So I, I think that it's important to make the connection between the two. And I think it can also release a lot of shame along the way. So I, I love the integration and a lot of my great mentors in the field have been excellent resources for that. So one being Gina Ogden, she was actually a sexual shaman and I was trained by her. So I use a lot of her tools. She's got this great resource called the 4D wheel of sexuality. And it basically looks at sexuality as this integration between mind, body, heart, and spirit and how to kind of help people move through their concerns using what we would look at as kind of a medicine wheel. And so tools like that have been really valuable, especially when people may come in a little bit, you know, afraid or fearful of talking about their sexual history. So we can use a tool like that to get a lot of information without having to, you know, go through a really lengthy assessment, like a sex history, where we can kind of use this visual tool to tell your story, tell your sexual story. So things like that have been great with integration of the two sexuality right. and spirituality. 
Yeah. And spirituality is all about connection, right? Whether, I mean, yes, religion is very different from spirituality. You can be religious and not a spiritual being at all. Um, And I myself grew up in a born again Christian home, evangelical home. So there's lots of shame surrounding sex, such as shame and guilt. And really, I feel like sex is a gateway to self. And Mm -hmm. you, you were talking about desire before. And it wasn't really until I started unpacking my sexuality um, and releasing the shame that I could really go through my life in a completely different way where I felt I could answer the question, what do you want? Yes. Yes. Like not even just sexually speaking, but just in general in my life, what do I want? Where do I want to go? And I think if you're carrying all of these, these blockages, it's really hard to see that path or have a vision for yourself. If, if it's, you're just kind of stuck in that shame cycle. Exactly. And I'm glad you mentioned that because that is the hardest question that I find that clients have to answer. What do I want? And I I think there's so many ways to figure that out. And sometimes I feel like what keeps people stuck is pressure or expectation to answer it right. You know, I've got to know all the things I've got to answer it really eloquently. And in reality, it changes constantly. So I I kind of bring a little bit of light to it. You know, what you wanted yesterday may not be what you want today. It's kind of like the food we, eat. you know, yesterday, we may have wanted this eight course meal. And today we want a quick, you know, fast food meal, you know, it's, it's kind of like sex. So it's, it's less about kind of knowing what you want at every moment, but being more flexible to kind of tuning in. I use a lot of mindfulness. So can we just be aware of what's going on? You know, do we need touch? What types of connection? And, and just being okay with maybe even naming one thing that we want and need on a daily basis. And that builds much more awareness around our sexuality than feeling like we have to answer it all at once. Because if you did that, I always say to my clients, if you did that, it might change tomorrow. So let's be open and flexible to how we look at that question. Yes, yes. So we're in a we're in a challenging time right now in this pandemic. Oh, yes. uh, what are some things that we can practice at home to improve our own sexual uh, wealth, wealth. Yeah. Sexual I wealth. Love that. I, love that. <laughs> I meant to say wellness <laughs> and health, but I said wealth and I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it too. <laughs> right. You know, your sexual currency wealth. So, uh, first and foremost, what I love about the pandemic, it, you know, the one thing that we can love is that it's kind of created some awareness around slowing down. And I think when we slow down, we look at what we want to prioritize. So the one thing I would recommend people prioritize is self-pleasure. Because if you're not spending time pleasuring your own body and knowing what you want, I think that it leads to pressure and expectations in partnered sex and a disconnection from the most important relationship you have in life, which is the one with your own body. So that would be one thing I would recommend during this time. And especially now, I mean, we're in California. The restrictions are getting, you know, they're changing day by day. So, you know, really take this time and honor having this time at home to spend time with your body and take your time with masturbation. You know, make it something that isn't quick, get it over with and I'm done, but, you know, make a whole night of it. Have a playlist listen to music like candles, do things like that, that are going to help you feel good about pleasuring your body. And then that will make it easier to communicate with a partner what you actually want and need. So that's one thing. I think the other is, you know, acknowledging how important it is that we have time alone. I think especially what I'm seeing is partners at home together are feeling stressed. And they are spending more time confined in a space together. So I think having some privacy and time alone is important. And how that is helpful for your sexual health is whether you're masturbating during that time or just taking care of your mind and body through things like meditation or breath work or just slowing down. It's so important and it really recharges your energy 
And that's what libido is all about. It's not this, you know, special sex drive. It's really our energy. And we need to be aware of our energy drainers and boosters, which really affect our overall health and wellness. Those are wonderful tips. Thank you so much. I know before the pandemic, it was always like, man, I wish we could just slow down. I wish we could just take a break. And I, I didn't mean for this long. I just wanted, I just wanted a little break. It, right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So final question. Um, this, the whole point of this is to encourage looking down there. And I would like to know when you first looked down there, how did you feel and how did you grow into self-love and discovery? You know, I would go back to that point of being a very curious young girl. And so I think I was very young. I want to say maybe three or four kind of being like, what is this? And looking at my body. And so I think it kind of continued throughout my life. But I want to say the biggest breakthrough I had with my body came from the late Betty Dotson's body sex workshop that I actually went to as a professional. So I was already practicing sex therapy. So jealous. It was amazing. I, you know, it was life changing in so many ways. First of all, Betty is just so inspirational and she, you know, her work, I will always carry it in my heart as an inspiration. And she's just, uh, you know, her, the way that she brings people together and breaks through that shame so quickly is just remarkable. And I hope that we all can kind of channel Betty when we need to. But looking again, looking down there, it was really vulnerable, even as a professional. I remember I brought my colleague with me thinking, oh, let's go do this workshop. And then all the things, right? We're naked the whole time. We're looking at our genitals. You know, we did a genital show and tell. So for me, that was really vulnerable, but it was also amazing, you know, to have Betty Dotson sitting next to you, looking at your vulva going, tell me about your pussy and going, ah, okay. And, you know, talking about it and naming all the things. And so to me, that was probably a breakthrough because even though I had looked and explored to do it in a group of women, professionals with, you know, people that I know and I'm getting to know and to be able to normalize that and look at that as something that I want to encourage my clients to do. It was huge. It was break a breakthrough. And it just made me realize that even though I don't kind of recognize any body or genital shame, that it's there. It's sort of this embedded aspect of our consciousness, especially as females, you know, especially as as women that we might have carried this down through multiple generations of shame. So I, I saw that and I felt that in that room. And I also released that during that weekend. And so that was a big breakthrough moment. So I know that, you know, there's some great professionals out there that are continuing the body sex. So I highly encourage anyone out there that wants to experience that maybe post COVID it's, it's really, it's, it's life changing. And that, you know, weekend is worth the investment of that weekend is worth the changes that you'll experience. So that was my first. And I encourage, you know, people to think about, you know, that as a possibility of maybe being, you know, an experience that they want to have as well. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing all that with us. And thank you for sharing your vulnerability with us. Um, I so appreciate you being here and I feel like we could talk all day, but we'll wrap it up now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so if you want to learn more about Dr. Shannon, please go visit drshannonchavez.com and you will get information about her practice shape, which sounds amazing. And you can uh, go to my website, michellelamore.com slash PC stands for Pussy Confidence. My next session will be begin on January 9th, 2021. So if you'd like to sign up, please visit michellelamore.com slash PC or follow me on Instagram at michellelamore. And I'm reminding you to grab a mirror and look down